All right, so glad you are talking with us today. Um, we have Dr. Maria Cristina Ospina with us, and she's gonna talk with us about um, REM behavior sleep disorder. So do you wanna share a little bit about who you are and where you practice? And Sure, so I'm Dr. Ospina, I'm a movement disorders neurologist here in Phoenix, and I also have a, a clinic in Tucson um, twice a month. And uh, I specialize in mostly Parkinson's disease. That's what movement disorders usually is. And so today we'll talk a little bit about uh, RBD or REM sleep behavior disorder, which is very, very common in Parkinson's disease. In fact, it's probably one of the very first symptoms that patients have even before they go to see the doctor. So many years, five, 10 years before patients develop motor symptoms of Parkinson's like a tremor, or rigidity, or slowness of movement, uh, patients may be acting out their dreams. And it's not something that they would notice, it's something that the spouse or their bed partner usually notices that they're either talking in their sleep or even, even yelling or kicking and screaming. Um, and that happens because during REM sleep in Parkinson's patients, you're no longer paralyzed. So you're free to talk, yell, scream, kick and punch, and basically act, act, act out your dreams. And usually it's not a problem for the patient, it's a problem for the bed partner or spouse that gets, you know, hears all this racket, gets woken up by the screaming, may get punched. Um, and many times people don't mention it because they don't think it would be related to the Parkinson's disease. But along with things like restless legs, depression, constipation, and anosmia or a lack of a sense of smell, um, those are seen very, very early in the disease of Parkinson's, way before the motor symptoms appear and you're sent to see a neurologist. Um, so usually what happens is that, you know, you get seen by the neurologist, you get put on medicines like dopamine agonists, like Mirapex or Regrip or Nupro, or even Cinemet, Carbidopa, Levodopa, and that increase in dopamine makes your dreams more vivid, and then you're more likely to talk and act out your dreams, and then, then it comes up in the clinic uh, that patients aren't sleepy. I mean, you could even get up and sleepwalk. And if it becomes a problem, then we can treat it with a small dose of clonopin or clonazepam at night to try to suppress those movements as much as possible. But that's what that is. It's related to the Parkinson's disease. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're becoming violent or anything like that. And it's really nothing to worry about, even though the screaming might be quite distressing, especially if you're, you know, go visit your kids uh, for Christmas break and then grandma screaming and that's that's what that is. It's called RBD or REM sleep behavior disorder. Wow. And does it always start like that intensely or does it start sporadically? So usually it just starts with some mumbling and then, you know, the, the words can be more fully formed and you can understand the words, you can understand the conversation. Uh, people can be seen moving their hands and feet, uh, like they're running or they're picking up objects. And some people can even get up and, and walk around. We had one patient where he was dreaming that the house was on fire and he literally got up and, and pulled his wife from her feet off the bed across the room and gave her some rug burns. Uh, and this was all while he was asleep. Uh, and it turns out, we don't know why, but our dreams during REM sleep tend to be very violent. They're, we're always being chased, or somebody's always trying to murder us, or there's a bear coming in, or aliens, or mm -hmm. ISIS, or something. And so that's why you hear a lot of the screaming. Oh, wow. And is it tied to restless legs? It's not necessarily tied to restless legs, uh, but restless legs is very common in Parkinson's disease. So people with Parkinson's tend to have both restless legs and RBD. Uh, people with rest, just restless legs uh, don't tend to have RBD as part of that. They're two separate things, but Parkinson's disease has both RLS and RBD. Okay. And then the RLS, we treat that with a small dose of a dopamine agonist like Mirapax or Requip or even Cinemet at night. Okay. And that can take care of the RLS symptoms. Or we can use a once a day. So if you're having breakthrough RLS during the day when you have to go and sit, you know, at a baseball game or at a movie or something, or you're in a, in a plane, then we can use a once a day to get you better coverage for the RLS. Okay. But those are very common in Parkinson's and they're seen very early. Uh, so, you know, many people say, ask, you know, well, if I have RLS, does that mean I'm going to get 
Parkinson's in the future, and that's not necessarily true. There's many other reasons why you can have restless leg syndrome. You could be pregnant, you have kidney trouble, you have low iron, um, but it, there's, there does seem to be a correlation between RBD and Parkinson's disease. And you know, once the PPMI results are, are published, then we'll have a better idea for the conversion rate. Okay. So, so not everybody that has um, RLS has PD, but most people that have PD have RLS. And the same thing with RBD. Most people that have Parkinson's disease have REM sleep behavior disorder. Okay. Oh, interesting. Uh, interesting. And um, wh so what, ha why is that, what is happening in the brain? Is it just not like shutting off at night kind of a thing? Right. So we don't know exactly what the mechanism is of why that that happens in the brain, but it's probably there's some, there's not the inhibition that there usually is, and therefore you're no longer in atonia, you're no, no longer paralyzed during REM sleep. Okay. Yeah, I didn't even realize that you were paralyzed during REM sleep. Yeah, so, I, and you would think of that, it's a good thing because you don't want to get up and start running around and, and you know, especially if you're asleep and you're not aware that the last thing you want to do is be running around the street, not knowing what you're doing. Right. So that, that, and it seems that during REM sleep, you know, the body is practicing things, uh, doing other things that it needs to do for, for learning and memory. And so if it can keep the body paralyzed, it can go through all of those events without putting the body at risk. Oh, okay. So that, but then, so it can happen throughout the night and does it happen every night or? Yes, it can happen throughout the night and it can happen every night or mostly it seems to wax and wane and we don't know what, you know, is it because people are more fatigued or tired? Is there more stress? Uh, so, so that there does seem some pattern that it waxes and wanings and some weeks are worse than others. Certainly we know that, you know, as we start increasing doses of agonist and, and, levodopa, we certainly make your dreams more vivid, and the more vivid they are, the more likely you are to, to act them out. Okay. What if you lived alone then? You may never know that this You may happen. never know. So, you know, we've had patients who were widowed, they were living alone, and this only came up after they went to visit their daughter over Christmas break, and, you know, they woke up the whole household with this you know, blood curdling screaming, that grandma screaming in the back room, and you know, the grandchildren are <laughs> woken up, and it's because she has RBD. Oh. But it's very common in Parkinson's disease. So it seems like it might be, especially if you lived alone, but it might be a good idea to kind of make sure your house is safe so that if you do wake up in the middle of the night and have some dream that you're acting out, that you don't grab a a weapon or a knife or I mean something potentially that you could hurt yourself. Right. So I mean certainly that you know, especially with Parkinson's disease and especially as patients start to hallucinate, you know, we want to have that discussion about guns in the house and, and making sure that they're secure and that you're not going to accidentally pick up a gun either in a hallucination or during some kind of RBD state. Um, and so certainly that's a conversation, especially in a state like Arizona, where many patients have guns at home, um, that as patients start to develop dementia and develop hallucinations, um, you know, that people don't get a shotgun and, and shoot the, their favorite armchair because this hallucination kept see, you know kept seating on sitting in there right but there are things that you can do then for hallucinations and help with the rbd if they if they go see their movement disorder doctor or neurologist right so you know the medicines remember the medicines are purely symptomatic they just treat the symptoms of the disease you know they don't stop or reverse the disease and so always we want to make sure that the benefits of the medicine outweigh the side effects of the medicines and because the medicines that we have like the agonist and levodopa they treat purely the motor symptoms of the disease but they make the non-motor symptoms of the disease worse so they can make your hallucinations worse they can make you more confused, they can make your RBD worse, they can make you more constipated. So it's always a balancing act between giving enough medicines that you're mobile, but not so much that you're hallucinating and, and calling 911 because you're distressed because there's people in the home uh, or you're getting up and sleepwalking. So it's always a conversation that we're having with the patient and making sure that, that our balance is right, that we're giving you more benefits than side effects. 
What about sleep medicines for people with Parkinson's or, I mean, are they problematic? Do they help? So, you know, sleep is one of the most difficult problems to treat in Parkinson's disease because there's many reasons why you're not sleeping well. One, you're not falling asleep, and two, you're not staying asleep. So, you know, RBD can be one of those things that can interfere with your sleep if you're waking up and sleepwalking. Uh, the restless legs can keep you from falling uh, asleep, and so and we can treat that with a small dose of an agonist. Um, you can have sleep fragmentation from the Parkinson's disease. So as your levels of dopamine start to drop, um, then the body becomes rigid and stiff and it's hard to turn in bed. So you wake up, you go to the bathroom, you come back to bed and you can't fall asleep because the body's not comfortable. It's running out of dopamine. Oh. So we can either treat that with another dose of levodopa at that time or use longer acting forms of levodopa to try to cover you through the night. So it's one of the reasons why movement disorders neurologists use once a day medicines, even though they may be more expensive or you know, we need to do a prior auth, is that we wanna make sure that you're covered during the rest of the night, just not while you're taking medicine during the day. So that sleep fragmentation we can treat by either using once a day medicines or adding a dose of levodopa in the middle of the night. And you can also have sleep apnea so that, you know, we can treat that with a CPAP machine and do a sleep study and give you CPAP to allow you to sleep through the night without waking up multiple times because you're running out of oxygen. Um, and then, you know, there's anxiety, there's depression, all of those things can cause insomnia. So that we need to, one, figure out what the reason is why you're not sleeping and then treat it specifically instead of just giving you a Band-Aid and saying, here, here's some Ambien or Lunesta or, you know, because those one don't tend to work very well long term and then can make you feel more groggy the next day. Mm -hmm. So it's always better to tease out what the reason is why you're not sleeping and then treat that specifically. And in Parkinson's, it's a combination of RBD, RLS, and sleep fragmentation. Okay. And many PD patients have a, a central form of sleep apnea. Oh, many Parkinson's patients have a... Yes. Uh -huh. So many times we order a lot of sleep studies to make sure that we're not missing that as a, as a something that we can treat. And now the machines have gotten a lot better, so you no longer feel like you have an octopus on, on your face. They have this small little cannula, so it's much easier, much more comfortable, and you're less likely to take it off in the middle of the night. Wow. So you mentioned, you know, movement disorder neurologists, and I, I don't know if everybody knows what that is. And I think that that's an important um, piece of information for people. So movement disorder neurologist is a neurologist who did a, a residency in neurology and then went ahead and did either a one or a two year fellowship just in movement disorders. Uh, so learning about Parkinson's and Parkinson plus syndromes, dystonia, central tremor, the use of Botox and DBS. And so they're specialized in just movement disorders. And so we don't do things like epilepsy or headaches or MS, ALS, neuromuscular things strokes we don't treat any of those patients it's purely it's the, the movers and shakers the movers and shakers <laughs> and uh, huntington's dystonia right. huntington's right so everything that has extra involuntary movements mm -hmm. okay okay and then we're the ones that specialize in, in using things like botox and dbs to treat things like dystonia parkinson's and essential tremor okay excellent um, and just so people know that, you know, there are lots of places that people can find movement disorder specialists. So, and we're certainly here to help people find a movement disorder specialist as well. It's good yeah, so in Arizona, we're blessed that we have a ton of movement disorder specialists, both in Phoenix and in Tucson, whereas many states maybe have somewhere between three and six or, or even less than that. So patients have to really travel either across the state or, or state or to another state to find a movement disorders neurologist. And here we, we have a ton. I think the only other place that has more is probably New York, Manhattan. Wow, mm -hmm. it is really centralized. So you move to Arizona. Exactly, if you have Parkinson's, move to Arizona and join Sarah's group. <laughs> <laughs> uh this is really helpful. So what should, if someone is, you know, uh, their spouse or their bed partner is doing some of this stuff, what, what should they do? How should they have that conversation? 
So, you know, many times people don't mention it and don't mention weird things because they think, oh, this could not possibly be due to either Parkinson's disease or the medication. But it turns out that, you know, the medicines that we use in Parkinson's cause all sorts of other weird compulsive behaviors. So, you know, if your loved one has suddenly started hoarding newspapers, you know, started going to garage sales and buying clocks, you know, that may be a result because they're on a high dose of a dopamine agonist. It's not just that they decided to go buy a bunch of clocks at a garage sale and go every Saturday. Um, so it can make you compulsive. And that could be anything from, you know, excessive hand washing to collecting um, to gambling to hypersexuality. So, you know, we've had patients who stay up all night sorting buttons by color and shape and you know they are losing sleep because they're compulsively arranging these collections and then as you lower the dose of their medication that compulsion to do those um, activities in that drive goes down goes away and and it you know doesn't interfere with their activities of daily living so but nobody would ever thought that oh my husband is now going to garage sales every saturday and buying clocks and now we have 55 clocks in the house that this could be because you know their requip is at 24 milligrams a day uh, and so people don't mention it. So that's, you know, that's why we always keep asking these weird things like, are you hallucinating? Do you fall asleep while driving or eating? You know, do you act out your dreams? Uh, because it could all be related to the Parkinson's. So the, don't, don't uh, underestimate what could be related. Like talk with your doctor about it. Exactly. So no matter how weird it is, then always bring it up because we've heard all sorts of weird things. And usually it is related to either the disease or the medication. And, and if it's related to the medications, many times we can make that behavior better by lowering the medicines. You know, remember, we always want to make sure that the benefits outweigh the side effects. And then, you know, if now there's, you know, stress in the marriage because you're spending too much money on buttons or clocks uh, and uh, or you know like the spouse mentions at 10 p.m. that oh we ran out of dog food and now he has to go out at 10 o'clock and buy the dog food uh, and can't switch to another task it's probably because the medicines are too high and as we reduce that that dose of agonist that drive to immediately get those tests done goes away and they can say okay I'll write a note and I'll do it tomorrow uh, so we want to minimize all of those little things that can cause stress in the relationship because the family is very important in treating the Parkinson's patient. It's not a disease that just affects the individual, it affects the whole family. Mm -hmm. And so we want to reduce as much stress as possible. And certainly if the spouse is not sleeping because there's all this racket going on and they're getting punched in the face, you know, they're not going to be too happy to then take care of you the next day. And if they're sleep deprived, so we want to make sure that they sleep as well as you do. Right. I, we have a person in a sport group that calls it a team sport. It's absolutely a team sport. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Equal opportunity disease. Yeah. Right, right, right. Uh -huh. And so that it, just like, you know, we want to treat the whole person, you know, just you don't just want to treat the tremor and dial out the tremor. You want to make sure that you've addressed any anxiety, any depression, constipation, because if you've just taken away the tremor, but they're still depressed and they don't want to get out of bed, you really haven't improved their quality of life. Right. Uh, same thing, you know, who wants to go through life constipated? That's not any fun. Right. Right. Oh, that's good. And um, what what about melatonin? Is that effective? I've heard different people talk about that. So, yeah, so certainly it's over the counter. Um, and so you could try it. And many people, it works well. It makes them sleepy. Um, and so if it works, I say keep it. If it doesn't, then, you know, we can try something else. So trial and error, but do it with your doctor. Exactly. Trial and error. And always make sure do the benefits outweigh the side effects, including to your pocketbook. So, you know, there's many supplements out there that are extremely expensive. And so, you know, if something costs two or three hundred dollars a month, that money may better be spent with physical therapy or exercise or going on vacation. Uh, so we'll just have to see, you know, where's where does that lie? You know, where do the benefits outweigh the side effects, including your pocketbook? And that's true for medications as well. Right. Oh, very good. Thank you so much for taking time to explain this. This is one of those disorders that I think a lot of people don't know about. 
Sure, yeah, because, yeah, nobody, who would have thought, you know? They just think, oh, they're dreaming or they're, they're actually awake and talking to me, but there's actually something called REM sleep behavior disorder. There's a reason for it. There's exactly, there's a reason for it, and, and it can be addressed. Yeah. Oh, and, and your loved one is not going crazy. That's good. That is all <laughs> people to know that. Um, right. Thank you so much for taking time with us to talk about this. Sure, anytime. Mm -hmm. we'll talk to you later. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye, Sarah. Bye. -bye, Sarah. bye.